we welcome today to Woodland Baptist Church, where we believe the most important thing is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're glad you're with us today. We're going to focus, as we seek to do each service, on Christ, but in a specific way today, about how he was the one that was anticipated to be a servant, a suffering servant. So as we sing today, as we worship and celebrate him, and we give thanks for God's great salvation that he's given to us in Jesus Christ, toward the end of our service today, you're going to have the opportunity, if you would like, participate in the Lord's Supper. So during this time, if you want to gather together some juice and crackers or bread and participate at, at the close of our service, please know you can do that. Or if you want to pull up this uh, later and view it, uh, this video and see it, you can do it uh, at, a, at a later time. But just wanted to make you aware of that. But most of all, we are glad you're with us today as we celebrate our Lord and what he would want to do in our hearts and in our lives as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Again, thank you for being with us. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. He shall, his truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place.
when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful that you'll never be enough
beyond even our imagination God you spoke and created everything Lord light this universe that's always growing God came forth because you said it was supposed to because you told it to and since then God since our creation Lord you are still so far beyond us God as you draw near to us God and we can feel your presence knowing that you are more than we can imagine God knowing that everything we need you have God since you spoke everything into existence God you've been providing for us you know what you're going to do Lord we can have gratitude and we can have joy even in the midst of so much uncertainty knowing that our creator draw near to us, so near to us God that we can feel your presence God that we can know you're here and we know you're working Lord and still realize that you are so far beyond us God why do you love us what you do your son died on the cross God let's just sum that up Lord I just want a heart of gratitude God all the time not a heart of fear not a heart of doubt not a heart of anger God I want a heart of gratitude because of who you are what you've always been and what you'll always be God I ask this I ask for this unworthy of you in the name of Jesus Christ Amen Thank you. Thank you for singing to the Lord and give thanks to our praise team for their work and their help to lead us uh, in exalting the Lord and some powerful uh, lyrics, some powerful words that we were able to share together. This morning, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We're going to read a couple of paragraphs that are in that particular chapter. Uh, as we gather and we think about how great uh, God's plan was, how great Jesus is in the fulfillment of what God had purposed and planned long ago before Jesus was ever born, long ago before ever Jesus showed up and uh, was crucified, that God was working for a long time, moving His purpose in this direction. When Jesus was on earth, I would think Isaiah 53 could be entitled or given the nickname, The Lost Chapter. Why would I say that? Well, during that time when Jesus showed up, they were, they being the Jews, they being the religious leaders, were really looking for the Messiah that was discussed and that was prophesied also by these same prophets of what we call the Old Testament, but the more militant looking Messiah, the more strong deliverer that was going to come to conquer uh, and set them free. And of course, the Roman government that was over them at this time, again, tilted them, I'm sure, to desire that, to pray for that. But there you have Isaiah 53 just nestled quietly, as it were, also a part of God's prophecy. And it would be this one, this one chapter, though there are, there are some others, of course, too, but this one just really and more fully and completely describes our Lord and how He has come to us the first time. So many of those other passages that we still refer to and look at in the Old Testament will be fulfilled. Jesus will come again, and we'll see that conqueror. We'll see that victorious warrior step up on the scene whenever God's time is ready for that. But the first time, when He comes to Bethlehem, 
and he comes in a way where he grows and matures and uh, it seems to be uneducated and all these things. Uh, Isaiah 53 was not on their radar to be descriptive of God fulfilling that passage and those that complement this idea of Jesus being more of a suffering servant. Isaiah 53 presents a lot of information to us physically what this suffering servant would look like growing up as a tender plant, that he would be also very emotional, described as a man of sorrows. But our focus today will be on that more spiritual component, that spiritual aspect that Jesus fulfilled in his coming the first time. Let's look at verses 4 through 6 and then verses 10 through 12 of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, and then we'll skip and read the end of the uh, chapter 10, 11, and 12. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt... He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. He shall, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the day that you've given to us. Thank you for the mighty work of your Holy Spirit that we have sung about this morning. And we thank you so very much that you're moving in our hearts already, stirring us as we think about the price you paid and the gift that came with such a great cost that was given to us. So Father, may your spirit continue to help make sense, to help bring encouragement, but also challenge and conviction to our lives regarding our relationship with you, our need to trust you completely and follow you during these days, to maybe take that very first step to acknowledge you as Savior of our life. So whatever movement we need to make, we pray that our hearts would, are already tilted to saying yes, that we want to agree with you about what you know about us and begin to adjust our life to you as you have revealed yourself to us today. And we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's filled with truth, filled with help and encouragement for our day. May it be very practical and helpful and understandable as we share it today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe the commercial can still be seen. I know it was very popular growing up and even for our adult children when they were growing up, but the popular Kellogg's brand cereal Frosted Flakes with Tony the Tiger and he would often end after a great description of seeing them in a spoon and being lifted up and eaten. They're great! will be what Tony the Tiger would say about those sugared cornflakes that they were consuming and that would be in that box whenever you got to the grocery store. They are great. Pretty tasty. This morning we think about He's great. That this is where we want to focus in upon Christ. That God was working toward what we now fully understand has been revealed to us. In Isaiah's day, there were still 700 plus years before the fulfillment of what was written by him and given to him by God would come to pass. Again, now we know all those things. 
But here from this word we see and begin to shape what was on the heart of God. And yes, it is indeed great. Two thoughts shape our mind and our uh, contemplation of God's word this morning. Jesus' great burden and God's great salvation. Number one, Jesus' great burden. In verses four through six, we see these words and these phrases. And it's almost like it's a poetry where it's repeating, trying to really make this point. And God is really underscoring through the prophet Isaiah of how this one to come, this servant, this one that would suffer, and how he would have to be the burden bearer to be able to make a way for the salvation that God was wanting to bring. We see words like born and carried in verse 4. Here we see the idea of lifting and bearing, but also the idea of carried also communicates not carrying over your head, maybe, but just dragging it along. That it's still being carried, but again, the burden gets heavy. <laughs> it gets hard to lift. And so it's still a, just moving along, but it's being dragged. Again, we can picture Jesus and the cross and all the things that was going on in his life as he moved to those final moments of giving his life ultimately, ultimately and completely for us. Verses 5, we see the word pierced, or maybe your Bible would say wounded. We see the word crushed, or the idea of Jesus being bruised. Again, now describing not just the dragging and the enduring, but kind of the the. the the gruesomeness of what he would experience, the awfulness of what would be taking place here, what we would know of Jesus being defiled, Jesus being even profaned because of what he would go through, that he would be broken on our behalf. Again, way before, here is God predicting and showing us clearly of what was going to take place. And then in verse 6, this phrase laid on means to encounter. It's the idea of putting or placing upon someone. All these words and phrases describe heaviness and burdensome that God in Christ is going to drag, that He is going to carry, that's going to be put upon Him. Yes, physically it's all there, but again, it's the spiritual weight. The spiritual weight of being a transgressor that Jesus was not, but He's going to take it upon Himself Hours upon himself for us so that we could be delivered, so that we could have relationship with God once again. Often students in college or whatever may be thinking about transferring. Transferring maybe to a different degree. One thing we want to make sure often for the student is the hours and the courses that they have taken up to this point. Will they transfer? Will they still be applied to maybe a different degree or if they go to a different school or institution, how much credit would be able to transfer so they won't maybe have to repeat classes and so they can maybe stay on target to a four-year time frame to getting graduated or will it be extended to a, a half a year longer or a full year longer? Again, transferring. Will it count? You don't want to lose credit. You don't want to have to extend paying more to stay and get your degree. We need to understand this morning, when it came to our sin, our transgression, our rebellion against God, a complete transfer was made. Jesus take, took it all. He paid the ultimate and final price. Though He was sinless, Though he was perfect in God, he took on the form of flesh to fully identify with us, but much more than that, to carry all the weight, all the burden, all the anguish, all the ugly of our life was laid upon our Lord so we could be forgiven, so we could be spiritually healed, spiritually made well, so that God would be satisfied. God would be pleased. God's anger against sin would be calmed and taken care of because of this perfect sacrifice. Yes, introduced to us in the Old Testament through sacrifices of animals, but now the ultimate animal, the ultimate Lamb of God that would give His life so we 
could have eternal life. Jesus is a great burden. We see forecasted. We see prophesied that was to come. And oh, how thankful we are this morning that it came true. Oh, what has been given to us because us, man, not able to do its part in the Old Testament and with the law, God said, just step aside. Let me help. Let my grace, let my good gift of Christ be what is needed. I'll even do your part for you because I want relationship with you that much. Yes, Jesus' great burden brings forth this second thought of God's great salvation. God's great salvation. In verses 10, 11, and 12 again that we read just a few moments ago, again, this purpose that would be accomplished. Again, we see words and phrases that begin to really begin to picture with depth and with great color to help us to get the full impact of what God was orchestrating, what God was doing, because it was indeed His plan. It was His initiative. On our own, we wouldn't have known that we needed this, but God knew that we did. So in verse 10, we see it was God's will. It was the will of the Lord. God as Father would offer His own Son and for Him to lay His life and to die. Father and Son, what a relationship. What a connection they have as we see the testimony in the Gospels. But there would come a time that the Father would have to turn His way and the Son would be on His own and that He would have to go through because of the weight and the burden and the sin that He was carrying that was not His but ours, but He took upon Himself. It was the will of the Lord to crush Him. It was the will of God to have that happen. And we would see the offspring and prosper in His hand. Other phrases there in verse 10 that denotes that what God was going to do through His Son and offering Him and bringing this crushing upon Him, that the unity, the reconciliation, the forgiveness that God so greatly desired, but yet would have to bear such a great cost for it to happen. We see in verse 10 that yes, that's where we're headed because of what Jesus would be able to accomplish and fulfill to please the Father, we would get great, great benefit. That we would be again reunited with what God would want for us. Verse 11, be satisfied and account it righteousness. Here we see the enjoyment of God's great salvation, that being made right with God, this idea of being justified, that we are no longer indebted to God, that we don't have to pull out our wallet as it were and start looking through to make some spiritual payment anymore. We don't have to get our rope and go over to the sheep's pen and get out the most unspotted lamb and bring it to the temple. We don't have to do that anymore. God has said He will do that. Christ has accomplished that. We can be made right with God. We can be forgiven. The portion of the many, dividing the spoil, we see in verse 12, kind of more military language, that whenever the king and his army come in and they are victorious and they win and they defeat the enemy, that they take the spoil, they take what is left behind in the leftovers and make it their own because the enemy no longer is there. They're been, they've been defeated. They, are, they have perished. And so they can take what was theirs and make it their own. That's what happens for us spiritually. Again, it wasn't ours, but we can now be an inheritance and a part of the family that we are grafted in, as Paul says, into this spiritual life because of what Christ has done, what God had purposed to accomplish through His Son. Again, centuries before it happened, now we know, as we live upon the other side, God's plan would come to pass. God's plan would succeed. Jesus would say, it is finished. First responders, counselors, there are those that we know in this life that step in. They alter the course for lives over and over again as they move into situations risking their own life, their own peril, 
to hopefully give life, extension of life, the hope of life and promise because of seeking to save, to rescue, whether it's sitting down with someone and moving through things that are, have hurt them and that they've carried up in their life to process that, or whether it's that fire or being in, in that accident, stepping toward to make a difference, stepping toward again so life can be sustained, life can move forward, not their life, but someone else's. That's what Jesus did. He stepped in to give us life. He would offer His own life. He would step in and be that intercessor. He would intercede and intervene for the sake of our lives. He did it on the cross historically. He did it there in an earthly way. But we rejoice this, even this morning. He continues to intercede. Jesus continues to intervene in our life. As He prays for us, 365, 24-7 up in heaven, Hebrews does a great job of describing the role and the work that Jesus still plays on behalf of us as His children, that He is offering words and prayers on our behalf so that our relationship with God can thrive and continue. Yes, Jesus' great burden would reveal and make known God's great salvation. Again, the ultimate expression of this great prophecy that would become a great reality for us culminates when we look at those moments on the night that Jesus would be betrayed, that He would ultimately give His life for the purpose and the reason that He has come when he would shift the mindset and the focus of what was known as the Passover and make it very personal for himself. That he would institute a new moment of deliverance. Not just the deliverance from Egypt now, but the deliverance from sin. That what is really needed was not Rome off their back, but a heart change within themselves. And so Jesus would describe and define that this time of remembrance, this time of coming together around the table, that we could share together a moment. In 1 Corinthians 11, a couple of passages, and if you're wanting to participate at home regarding the, the supper, we invite you to maybe do that now or at a later moment, but use these scriptures to maybe help. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. As we think about the Lord's table, as we think about coming to dine with Him and remember who He was and what He's done. Yes, the cost was great. It's definitely worth remembering. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said... This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we thank you that we remember you and your body. A perfect one that was given to the full extent for us. We receive the bread today and partake of it. And give thanks. In Jesus' name. Paul goes on to write in that same passage in 25 and 26, in the same way also he took the cup. After the supper saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With the cup in mind, would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we receive and remind ourselves of your blood that was shed for us. And we thank you that all through the scripture we see the importance of blood and the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. Going all the way back to Abel, then in the Old Testament law that was shaped so much around offerings that were sacrificial, where unspotted animals were a part of renewing, refreshing, repenting, getting back on track with God. So it wasn't completely new, but oh, the demonstration now that you, God, in human form would come and give that full extent. We thank you again that as we remember you today, 
for what you get, did for us upon the cross. And we thank you that you knew our greatest need. And our greatest need was that sin could be taken care of. So thank you for making us at one with you. In Jesus' name. We move toward a time of response, a time where you can meditate and give thanks to God, but also to open up your heart before Him to receive Christ for the very first time. Or maybe to renew your life and your covenant with Him that is one that maybe has taken some detours, has gone along, but now in reminding ourselves of the great burden that Jesus bore, reminding ourselves of the great salvation that His burden bearing allowed for us now to experience and to live out. Maybe that would humble us. Maybe reminding ourselves refreshes us to give our all. That we too can maneuver our life like Christ with such humility, with such dependence upon God, that maybe we're living our life in these days of pandemic and all these things getting more selfish getting more independent, getting more isolated instead of keeping our life open to God, open to His heart, open to His purpose that still needs to be accomplished as we follow Him and listen to Him and be guided by His Spirit. So I lead us in prayer. And at this prayer, you can have this time of meditation and response to Him. Our Father, we thank You so very much that You're calling us today. You're dialing us up. You know our phone number, as it were. And you have stepped toward us, not just in Isaiah's prophecy, not just in Jesus coming in Bethlehem as a baby, but, Father, you are stepping toward us in a fresh way. You are making known the cross and your burden that you bore for each of us in a very personal way. May the Spirit of God paralyze us, as it were that we will need to be staying where we are or moving towards you in a very strong and intentional way because we have come to realize there is truly no life without you. And we need you today more than ever to think right, to live well, and to accomplish what you would want to have for our lives. There is so much at stake, the generations that are coming behind us And so, Father, our response to you today needs to be significant. And we pray we'll adjust our life to receive you for the very first time as our Savior if we have not done that. But if we have, that we would renew, that we would return back to you so you would return to us. And that, Father, that cross-bearing life that you did, not just to save us, but to give us an, an example that we would also embrace. That as we have remembered you today, broken bread and the cup, we thank you that you are still pursuing us in a strong way. May we yield, may we surrender to your life. And we pray this in Jesus' name.